Uh, oh, hi, thanks for coming to the hi. house. Hi, how are you? <laughs> nice to see you nice and to meet see you. you too. Indeed. Why are you feeling ornery today? Oh, it's just one of those days. Is it? Yeah, like you know when everything comes together at once, like dealing with uh, annoying online people, and there's lots of logistical stuff to deal with, and your work piles up, and. If you look at a month that has 30 days, let's say, and you were to put a check mark or an X on those days, generally when you look at a month, how many X's are you having for shitty days and how many check marks are you having? Oh my, they're both, they're all both usually. Are you equipped to handle them both well? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I am. And, and it, it just, there's, cause there's no running from it. I guess there's a, there's a surrender to the shittiness in the world. You, know, <laughs> like you just, you surrender at some point because you know more is coming. Like you can only, yeah. you can only uh, be upset that things are bad so often. Because like, you, you get bored or you get bored of being annoyed. You well, know? you know, I know a lot of people who come from certain parts of the world where they have, People who are Palestinian or people who are Iraqi or Afghanistan, from Afghanistan. And a lot of the older men that I know have battle fatigue and they didn't fight. They just have fatigue Mm -hmm. and they don't want to engage about this shit. They don't even want to connect with politics Mm because their family or their lives, their father's lives, their mother's lives. So they have a fatigue that can set in for them. Have you ever felt that? Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely, but when there's no running from realities, there isn't a chance to get tired. Yeah, exactly. They they came here yeah, to avoid that. Yeah. And for you, it's still happening here. Yeah, and I left home um, to go to residential school when I was 15, and I moved back for a brief period, but I haven't been home. And it creates a very strange thing in, in, in me where I'm constantly missing a huge part of myself and then I also really enjoy the the control I have Here. in my little isolated house in the city. Right. You know, like it's a, you can pick and choose what you want, who you want to see, when you want to see them, these kinds of things. But I always, I inevitably, I always feel like a foreigner. And I wonder, I wonder that, like, you know, people talk about Canada as the melting pot. You were discussing your mother being an immigrant. Um, where was she born? Uh, she was born in Poland. They, oh, they, you're and, Polish. Yeah, Me too. And, and, you're, yeah, and Ukrainian. <laughs> and so they post-war uh, escaped to come here. Whoa. Yeah. So that was, that's, that's my mother's side. My father is a Greek from Egypt. Okay. Yeah. I'm the first person in my family born uh, in Toronto. Well, I was thinking about like people talking about Canada as the melting pot and like how we deal with displacement because everyone's either an immigrant yeah. over the last couple hundred years or we've been displaced from our land and our cultures. So it's on a bad day, it's a country of displacement. Right. <laughs> but on a, on a good day, it's a mosaic. Yeah. Right. But and, and to be so thankful for. Right. Is, yeah. that, is that a complicated position for you to have? Um, it, I only get annoyed when it's Im, uh, immigrants complaining about other immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the richest thing ever. I know, right? it's so ridiculous. <laughs> you, it's like, you, hey, you guys are going to come over and do the exact same thing we did, I bet. Right. Well, that's the whole thing. Like, they just want the door to be closed behind them as long as they're in the party. Yeah. That's what they want. Mm-hmm. Um, is it's Canada, not Studio 54 here. It's not. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> is this a place that you are thankful for? I, again, like I'm, I'm typically a moving target because mm-hmm. um, I'm constantly in flux, growing, mm-hmm. you know, trying to be a better person. Right. So it just depends on the day. Uh, there are many, many things I'm thankful for in this country, but there, are, uh, when it comes to specifics, like if we're looking in context of um, the treatment of Indigenous people, I'm livid, disgusted. Yeah. Uh, just f- and, and then I'm, I'm even more disgusted at the ignorance surrounding any of these topics. Um, Do you think it's willful ignorance? Sometimes. Sometimes it's herd mentality. Sometimes it's uh, a lack of connectivity, like people unable to grasp the concept that this entire continent was overtaken through acts of genocide and slavery. Mm-hmm. And that... 
in order for that to happen, we had to be seen as lesser. And that includes all the slaves that were brought over, that in, in, anyone outside of the, the norm, which is the hetero, heteronormative white society, yeah. is, was seen as lesser. Our religions, our, our cultures, our, our way of our, what respect is, what dignity is, we had to be seen as lesser. And that is swimming in the subconscious of every single person living on this land, including us. So for people to be unable to put together that this is what our continent was built on with how society is functioning today is just seems to me like an almost purposeful lack of connectivity. But I, I agree this is a great place where there's a division between me and a lot of people in my lives is that I, I maybe I listened to too much punk rock as a kid, but I always blame the voter. I all I don't blame the media. I always say, what made you think they were on your side? What made you think the government was on your side? I, they're not. <laughs> like, sure, they do nice things for us, but why would you expect a newspaper, which incidentally they all started as you know rags for their party? That's the history of newspapers mm -hmm. as we know. So. It's on you to be harmonious. It's nobody. I never, I never, I get the role the media plays. I'm not naive to it, but I don't blame it. It's like they're doing what they do. Yeah, and it's easier to place blame on like, you know, the government, the education systems. Like you can't blame the individual for not knowing because they're not provided the information, but you can blame the individual for not seeking out the information yeah. and for being influenced by... Uh, the herd mentality of people that all all want to gang up and and hate on a specific right. culture, and uh, w want if you want to carry malformed opinions, I suppose that's your prerogative. But when it results in deaths of a specific culture and a specific race, then it's unacceptable. And the and the unwillingness to address the murders or de address the suicides and to continue to allow it to happen, mm -hmm. I think then becomes your responsibility. Yeah. And, it, and uh, people don't understand that complacency is really harmful. Like when I hear people say, I don't see color or I don't, I'm not racist or, mm -hmm. you know, they're like, for example, if you're talking about uh, trying to talk about white privilege mm -hmm. and somebody goes, well, there's poor white people too. Like it's just so far removed from the concepts that the amount of work that needs to be done is so great. And I, I think that uh, if people in, in elementary school and in the school systems were taught uh, actual facts and not just uh, government prerogative, then there, there would be a lot more open-mindedness. And the thing is, I am, I'm disdainful and I'm angry, but I also have not lost hope in the fact that I believe that people can be very good-hearted and can be very intelligent and can be compassionate and do want to work together. And it's just, rather than paying attention to the goddamn dipshit with an IQ of 20 who's online screaming, that, that maybe yeah. just like focusing on uh, my peer group and a group of people that want to move forward and and do have compassion and want to be the good person and want to do the right thing that's the focus of why we do why we do what we do why are we doing the show why are we why are we immersed in art why are we involved in our culture this is this is our culture i have two thoughts on that one is there some value in redefining what intelligence means? Because people use the word intelligent and they generally apply it in only one way. The other thing is you you are always scrapping with that 20-point IQ dipshit on Twitter. <laughs> like, you are, you, I don't know if you love doing it, but you do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do it. And I I am a very, very angry person. And I really have, over the years grown to love my angry self because well, there's a lot to, to be yeah. angry about. Also, if, you don't, if you're not angry, shit's not going to change, right? A lot, that's how a lot of change happens. A bunch of fucking people get sick of it <laughs> and then do something. Mm -hmm. Isn't that how change generally happens? And I'm I'm a very, very peaceful person. Like in my house, like I'm the most harmless person 
in the world when it comes to like people I love and respect. Yeah. And but but unfortunately, when you're from a culture where like nary a day goes by where you don't hear some news that would from your own community or from your small group of Inuit, when you don't hear some news that isn't so devastating that it's completely spirit breaking. And you know, the reason those things are happening are because of residential schools and because of lack of funding and at the hands of the government, of course, I'm angry. Of course, I want the people I love and respect, my family, my friends, who I grew up with, my daughters, myself, I want us to be okay. That's self-preservation. So if anger is a side effect of that and I need to like go on Twitter and like yeah. tell someone they're a piece of shit, then I guess that's that's what's <laughs> gonna happen. You know? I don't think it's a side effect. I think it's actually the fuel. I think it has to be I think anger, as Rage said, is a gift. And I think people have gone to great lengths to try to make us feel badly about our anger. Mm-hmm, and that's mm-hmm. because, of course that's why I don't that's why I reject most religions and almost all spirituality because it's this concept of your reward is in the afterlife. Go fuck yourself. If we don't fix shit now, mm-hmm. right? That they do that to distract us from what's happening to impoverished people here. Well, you know? isn't that how people were enslaved to build all of, like all of feudal society? Yeah. yeah. Religion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. And when people, when people, like, it also, like, the funny thing is I'm I'm dealing, okay, what am I dealing with that's uh, annoying me? Not that, I'm sorry to whoever's listening, I'm sure your day didn't want to be what fucking annoys Tanya Tarak, but, like, here it is. If you're going to listen, gonna listen to this show when you and I talk, <laughs> we'll, we'll deal with it. Um, I'm dealing with a, a, a whole bunch of people that really love to go online and... Uh, tell a demographic of people that have the highest suicide rates in the world pretty much to kill themselves because they eat seals mm-hmm. or because we eat seals and and wear seals. And there's no vegetation up there. And I, I've seen a $23 head of cabbage at the store. And people, there's a lot of unemployment, a lot of poverty. And people like to say, oh, it's because you're lazy. It's like, no, no, there's a disproportionate amount of what has been given and what has been taken. Like if you look at this scientifically, uh, the government funded residential schools that stripped us of our language, stripped us of our culture and uh, caused a horrific amount of deaths and abuse and ongoing intergenerational trauma that fuels the abuse. And that was all in conjunction with us losing our own legal system. Anyone who's executing our own Inuit laws are being imprisoned in this foreign society, right? So we've got that. That has happened to us. That has weight. It has mass. Think it was, about it. It was illegal for you to make a dream catcher for somebody of, if that was what they would do. It was illegal to practice your own art. I would speak our own language, anything. That's you a, know? It was and, illegal. And then the only way to rectify the weight and mass of this situation is for the government to fund schools mm-hmm. that teach our language, that give us back our culture, that provide proper mental health care and therapy, and they fund our plight to rectify their wrongdoing. Then they have to create work or they have to create some kind of universal income. Because I think a government's job, on at least my view of the role of a government, is some version of keeping people safe, but really you have to give them an opportunity to carve out a life that they want. And that part of that is jobs. And we have an economy. And if they don't do... For, well, we should start with drinking water, but... Which is, I, I used to be, I used to love being a Canadian when I was 12. I, at this age, I'm like, I, don't, I fucking hate countries generally. <laughs> I think countries are stupid. And I think, I think nationalism is stupid. And I think national pride what is, is stupid. What is this? The pessimism show? No, it's not, no. <laughs> we're, you and I shouldn't have met. We're, right. we're cut from the same cloth. It's not good. <laughs> but, I, but I do believe that those feelings are because I think people are important. And community is important. Yeah. But, that, but the, those old things, I don't give a fuck about it anymore because it hasn't worked. For everybody. And if it doesn't work for everybody, it doesn't work for nobody, anybody. That's mm-hmm. how I kind of feel mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. But I like the fact that it comes out in your art. I just, I, and I think, does this, does these, these feelings started first, right? How you felt. Was art the outlet or were you just doing it? 
I think I'm always, yeah, like uh, the book was an ac- accident. And the end, and in, in essentially the music career was also an accident. Um, um, Des- was it, is it destiny? Yeah, f- fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> Chance, maybe. Um, I'm with you on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, with the, with the singing, mm-hmm. it had just, I've always, I've always been expressive. I've always expressed myself. Like, I loved making my classmates laugh. I, like, would, yeah, like, love laughing. And uh, I just remember being a small child, like five years old, and like listening to, you know, musics and just dancing around and expressing myself in a way that had the same feeling. Right. And I, and then it, that's it's come out in all sorts of different ra- ways. These like made up rituals I used to do, or or um, the the way I tried to bend reality, or p- the way people thought, or like I just have always been really fascinated by our senses and how we can control them, or the lack of control we have of them, and how you can control yourself and not control yourself, and the balance of trying to find the balance in everything. And that's why I, I really give a lot of respect to children, because I remember having these thoughts when I was five. I remember, th- like, I was, I'm not any more smart I, now than I was then. I just have more experience, mm-hmm. right? So ch- people really disrespect children, I think, by talking down to them and, you know, um, treating them like they can't handle things because I think kids, because they're so open, can can handle more than you think they can. And, and Imagine they have to handle, they have to handle being alive, not knowing anything about it. Mm-hmm. Being five, you don't know anything about what this is yeah I remember being five and like being totally confused by the fact that I couldn't hold up two ends of a skipping rope and swing <laughs> you know they say yeah. that you can teach them the, the ways of the world but they're they're smart you know yeah. they're smart they know what they're doing what were you dancing to if you said you remember being there and dancing to music what was I it? remember putting on like all my mother's jewelry and I think it was Lucy in the sky with diamonds yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's a great... That's a memory I have. Great but, acid trip for sure. But, my, yeah, my parents uh, listened to a lot of music growing up, and I have two brothers, so... And I was woefully looked a lot like a little boy and, and stayed like that well in, well after everyone else went through puberty, and, like, all, most of my friends were uh, male, um, and I always strongly identified with what, like, people would consider masculine, mm-hmm. um, like sports driven and like very physical and w- w- having pride and strength, like emotional strength or, or like, I don't right. know, just. Was it, is that, are you referring to that as in, in a positive way? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And then, and like, uh, yeah, I, I remember in the eighties in Nunavut, like talking about gay rights and people just being like, it was completely shut down. Out there? Yeah. yeah. All, all over the place. Everywhere. Yeah, shut the fuck down. Like, no one <laughs> wanted to listen to that. Um, but so, so but what, what introduced you to that, though? What? Get, like, get right. It's the concept. Well, because I crushed on yeah, my friends. There you go. And, <laughs> and, and then, I, you know, like, I crushed on my friends, and I saw people hooking up with yeah. the same sex and everyone being super upset about it. And I just knew everyone. I was like, well, we're all awesome people. Like, there's no difference between you two having a crush on each other and you two. And, it, and it, the idea of the morality attached to it, like that if I was attracted to a woman, I somehow would want to sleep with all women. Like yeah. that whole thing. Like, oh, I don't mind gay dudes as long as they don't hate on me. It's like, like, like who's going to say they'd want your ugly ass? Yeah. Like, shut up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it doesn't, people not right. being able to understand just because you're attracted to Yeah this or that doesn't mean you're immoral in other ways or, or out of control right. in other ways, right? Just these simple thoughts. I just remember that. I remember knowing that back in the day and kind of getting in trouble for it. But I've always been expressive and I've always uh, wanted people to be happy and healthy and fed and do well. And I've always just like had such an, like a crippling compassion crippling 
right? So, and it's often like the people, a lot of the people we lose to suicide are people that are overly sensitive, not overly sensitive and compassionate people mm -hmm. because like it's a hard, it's a hard life and people go through a lot. And to like retain your sense of self in in the sensitivity and the compassion becomes very difficult, very very difficult. And uh, uh, you know, people talk about the suicide crisis in Nunavut without. I find Canadians talk about it like it's something that's happening in Rwanda, or they talk about it like oh these you know this idea the, these people are downtrodden. Um, but it, but personally, like I can really attest to the benefits of humanizing any culture or or population because like I know myself like what am I? What do people think I am? A seal clubber? What do they think I am? Do they think I what whatever it is they think I am or what people are typically isn't. And just like impoverished people, like this is a thing I grapple with all the time, like the the hierarchy of money and capitalism, like that's really interesting. I'm so fortunate to have been raised in a town where, you know, how much you made didn't make a difference, right. you know, and like... It's a big factor in a lot of kids' lives. It's, it's huge. And I have to be careful not to um, shower my children too much you know, um, because I, I I love the humility that comes from judging someone on how they look at you and how they accept themselves and their their actions mm -hmm. rather than what they're presenting as. You know, so um, anyway, I was always expressive and I always had journals and I remember my dad read my diary when I was like 12 and so I stopped doing that for a while. Was it mortifying? Did he learn anything? Yeah, yeah, it was not good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Okay, so finish your story. I want to ask you a question. But carry on. <laughs> and so I started keeping a journal uh, when I went off to uni. Yeah. I applied to a university or an art school in every province and just hoping to get in and got accepted into all of them. <clears throat> and then I just put a bunch of pieces of paper in the hat and picked one out. And luckily I got uh, NASCAD on the East Coast because uh, I find East Coast Canadians, there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, there's great points uh, really t yeah. between, between, between us, yeah. Uh, I'm really glad I didn't get the West Coast because I tried to live out there for a little while. And if one more asshole came up to me and told me they were a shaman because their dog talked to me, talked to them while they were on mushrooms, I was going to like punch <laughs> someone. I was like, that's when I got really punk when I moved to the, I was like, you hippies need to shut up. Like, <laughs> stop talking to me about shamanism. Right. Like, this is my religion right. and this is sacred to me. Like, stop, stop it. Stop it. You don't know what that is. You're just using that to seem like you're spiritual or have an ego. Like, you know, it but just what, what stop it. I, I don't do mushrooms, nor do I, like, as I said, I reject religions. But I wondered if, was this their way of trying to connect and this speaks to them? I think it was a lot of young people getting really excited about connecting with the land. Right. Like going camping and like... Being part of nature, I think there was just a lot of people that were kind of trying to break free of like the urban, rich urban life. But like you know, it's 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 just difficult. It's kind of yeah. it's it's hard when you come from that culture. And like often when I'm getting interviewed, I'll have people ask me, you know, about about shamanism or about our religion or yeah. about. Or what they what oh what they what do they call it folklore folklore right yeah, yeah folklore, folklore. Yeah. and then I'm always yeah. like yeah like the Bible's a really good legend yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Zacharias yeah. Kunduk said that to me I'm like what do you think about the Bible he goes yeah it's a good legend <laughs> <laughs> that's true I, I lumped them all in the same category which is like is that your thing fine but that ain't my thing right so yeah. I, really, I, really, I think that's okay so so out west that is where the punk happened well you. that's where well I grew up. Kind of, I wouldn't, yeah, I grew up a little edgy, but like it was, it was when I was around that kind of, I, 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 I reacted very negatively to that. Right. And I remember people just being like, 
oh, yeah, peace and love, you're way too hardcore. Like, and and I, I was grappling with uh, going down to Halifax for the first time and being like, wow, like there's people here that didn't grow up seeing these things. There's um, like the majority of the people, like, a, a lot of their grade one class isn't dead. You know, like I started really looking at what the difference was and how how I was judged or not judged by by being a foreigner mm -hmm. in in my own country. And being like having I it was it was some of the first times that I've dealt with racism too. Like I remember some some man shoving me in a club and telling me to get a green card. And I was just didn't even know what a green card was. I was just like 19, straight from Nunavut in residential school. Right. Like, I, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. You know? Like, it, 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 like and, you're trying to insult me, but I don't get it. Because, <laughs> and I know. was like, what's, what's that? Like, <laughs> you're assuming I'm a foreigner. I don't That's know what right. it was. But uh, so, so it was really an interesting process for me to start to unpack the colonial process and initially when I came south I assumed that we were having a hard time up north simply because of the isolation factor and I often lean on that as kind of like a prerogative like oh maybe there isn't the funding to develop this tiny population so far up north right but then I realized that what was happening with the reservations down here like People are being kept in poverty and people are being mistreated and not given equal rights and people have suffered the same residential schools and people have suffered the same process and my excuse of it being too far away couldn't be applied. It's like right here, right beside everybody, right under your nose, in defiance to the Constitution. How are people sitting around complacent? How do you wake up every morning and go, I don't need to think about politics. Five stars, Canada. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, like, uh, how? Where are you? Who are you? Right. You know? Well, this is it. But so here it is. Excuse, that, excuse that accent. Yeah, I, I, I want to know who you were mimicking. Like, who sounds like that? Probably some girl in high school I didn't like. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so... Inaction is as damaging as action, right? Complacency is dangerous, as you said, so, yeah. or harmful. So the people who don't pay attention what happens under their nose in this era, mm -hmm. when we know, mm -hmm. it's out. And it's out. We're all talking We're about it. We're still talking it. about it. If you don't do something about it, it's on you. It's on them. Mm -hmm. It's on the people. And it's on, it's like people call me an activist, but it's on me. Like I'm the one taking the phone calls at night. I'm the one helping people. I'm right. I'm the one like, yeah, and we all are. Like our community is a community of therapists, police people. Like we're all trying to help each other while more and more is just being poured on us every day. Right. So it's just like when, when you see someone living like, and, and like the, it's that's where it's hard for me in the city. Like when I'm standing at the counter and someone's upset because like, you know, the pattern on their the cappuccino isn't good enough. I'm just like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> like, can you be more tiring? Like, I don't know if you can be more tiring. Well, who knows what their day was like? Maybe they had the worst day with their kid. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. No, you're right. I know, just, I know what you mean. Though. Yeah, sorry. I don't. Yeah. Like, what is this? The also the complaining show? No, but... <laughs> <laughs> but no, what it is is a real. It's real people talking about <laughs> about because I think I think that I've been in the media for twenty five years and I've seen the shift in the last ten, and it's been a big change in the last ten in the way the media talks about things. Mm -hmm. And I remember being on the air when I don't know more started, and you looked around and went different. This is now a different thing. And the very beginning of that, there was a lot of suspicion, which is we've heard this before. We've talked about truth and reconciliation before. And this will just go away like it always does. But it feels different now, partly because of the activism, but partly because of the artists. There are a lot of artists to interview. Mm -hmm. That's a very big difference in the last 20 years. We, we love Willie Thrasher. I've been playing Willie Thrasher for a long time. He's so awesome. <laughs> love, love Willie Thrasher. Never, never had access to Willie Thrasher at the time. Yeah. Right? Um, um, but now there's more. We've we had Buffy here. And Buffy, Ian Campo was here talking about when Buffy said to him backstage, it used to be so lonely back here, right, Aww. at these award shows. And yeah. I think and uh, she was referring to Tribe. She was referring to you. 
um, now with Jeremy, there, there's way more coming. And mm-hmm. I think that's going to have a really big impact on the next generation of kids. Mm-hmm. Do you feel that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it makes me very, very happy. There's a lot to be thankful for. A lot. And, uh, that, but it, it feels, the problem is with that, th- when I'm having an ornery day, mm-hmm. is that feels like theory. And it feels like something that's coming. And the reality is still there. Right. The reality is still in the news that comes. Like we from don't there. have time for it to come. It's got to be here already. Yeah, like yeah. it should have been here. So like it's it's just like if you're really thirsty, a like drop of water on your tongue is it's great and everything. Yeah, <laughs> give me give me a glass of water. Right. Give me a glass of clean fucking drinking water. How about that? Yeah. You know that might be nice. <laughs> this is why <laughs> the government is a not just this government. But the previous ones are colossal failures. Mm -hmm. And you're a failure on every level if one of your citizens doesn't have access to clean drinking water. That's, you're like, in my, from my worldview, the government is a failure on every level Mm -hmm. if every citizen doesn't have access to clean drinking water. So I don't give a fuck about the government anymore, except to fight them, because yeah, I think that that's the num- that's, that's, that should be your minimum for a country, don't you think? Well, and then some people provide the argument, like, what would you do without the government? There'd be no streets, there'd be no buildings, there'd be no schools. And it's like, yeah, give us the streets and buildings and schools and sewage treatment and give us all that and give us this. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> that's good, too. Yeah. We're not saying we don't want a government, we just say we want a good one. Yeah, a better one. A better one. A one, one that is constantly striving and moving forward. Yeah. Not one that's stagnant. Right. Which you is, know? And like, when we keep voting in dipshits, it's like <laughs> kind of hard to... <laughs> and anyway, let's... Uh, but I'm sure you've met some beautiful politicians. I've met some pretty beautiful politicians mm-hmm. as well. And I know that a lot of them really want to affect change. So it's the system that is skewed, is designed this way. Well, it uh, the system itself handcuffs people. Right. Right. As they get in anyway. Are you thinking about all this stuff when you're writing Split Tooth? Oh, I'm literally not thinking of anything when I'm writing. Like, uh, I'll try to hit a point, and it happened a few times in the book where it was just kind of writing itself. Mm-hmm. And with the music, it's the same. It's kind of like this release of control. Like, I just want the sounds to go where they want to go, where, where guide us sounds, mm-hmm. because... Uh, we're lucky enough to have ears and be in this body and have, it, it feels very physical to me like where sound goes. So a few times in the book that happened. But so I, going back to the, the uni days, I kept a, kept a diary and always have. And then uh, we started the music touring and there were just a lot of long airplane rides and van rides. And so I was always writing. So the book was written long long before it was ever published and uh and it was written without intent of anyone seeing it and I just remember uh being being on the bus there was a few circumstances or where, where you know someone asked what I was doing and I'm like oh I'm doing this writing here check it out and people being like oh like that's pretty good and yeah. I me not believing them because uh my own insecurities like I that's what I was talking about this racism that's in our hearts like I always thought oh there's no way I could fit in with those fancy writers like I'm you know dumb me you know like it the self-doubt everything because well, they want you to feel that way uh, well yeah and because I and I do and I did yeah. and so I I just never believed it was good because I was showing people that already love me so I'm like yeah, yeah I can't trust you <laughs> and uh, so I showed I showed um basically a stranger and then yeah. we we went and a, a penguin approached penguin and then and then that that came forth and uh, Nicholas Garrison helped me with the with the editing and he was really really influential and I like I really love thanking him because a book just like uh, an album it uh, you know the, the that's my name on the book but mm-hmm. and that's my name on the album but like the album producer and like everyone who helps and everyone who does everything. It's like you go to a festival, if no one's there to help, there'd be no stage, no sound people, no, like there'd be no sound, no microphones. People aren't 
thankful of the process. And like, I just always have to thank Nick because he really helped me through it. He basically was my guidance counselor and or therapist because working through letting that information about me and my personal life, my history and my ideas out was a very, very hard challenge. Once it was out, it was fine. But there was a lot of fear surrounding releasing that book. Um, Kept you up at night? Absolutely. Well, it was it's it was triggering, right? Right. To like and and people, ah, it's weird. Like uh, that's another thing online that bothers me. Like people use that term triggering for anything. It's yeah. a kind of a joke now. But like, it'd be hard to. There were all those pieces. I basically never want to read them again. I don't listen to my own music at home ever. I don't. It's gone once right. once something's done. It's gone. Like even the, even the new record, uh, or do you or you? No, wait. I won't listen to that. Right. But there's only one song out there, so we, it's still yours, right? There's still a bunch of songs that that are still yours. <laughs> no, you know? no, I just I just I'm, I'm like okay, next. Yeah. Like it's just it's to me these objects and these things aren't the result of what I'm doing. It's how what's next, right? You know, like. What that's what's exciting, like the the new record, the new whatever I do. But so anyway, this book was published, and that was great. And like uh, with the music, when where I grew up in Cambridge Bay, my mother, uh, incredible family history. My father is a result of uh, two World War II veterans, <clears throat> and he ended up in Canada. I think he moved here when he was four or five, and then my mother was born and raised on the tip of Baffin Island, northern tip, Pond Inlet, and then relocated, went through the relocation. And that's another thing people talk about, oh, yeah, the government relocated some people. There's, like, the details and everything surrounding that is this, like, the absolute devastation. Like, people say it's cultural genocide. Like, that's straight genocide. There's no disputing that fact. And what happened to my mother, what happened to my family, it's an utter disgrace they should be compensated. We should be taken care of. And uh, at the very least, I want my friends and family to have some proper fucking health care. The same that I pay taxes for. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so she was, right. she, she was, she was raised, uh, or relocated. And then we moved to a place called Cambridge Bay. And there was a, I was fluent in Inuktitut before we moved to Cambridge. And Cambridge Bay has had a, because it's more central and closer to the mainland, had a devastatingly um, he that was impacted in a huge way from the residential school program. So I moved to a place where people weren't speaking in Oktodut anymore. I didn't right. hear throat singing, didn't see drum dancing. I didn't, there wasn't a lot of like... Uh, Your own culture. Yeah, yeah. people yeah. were, because well, it was a different time, right? People are moving in one direction. And and uh, my mother stopped speaking in Oktodut to me, in, even in our home. So, so it... Uh, I didn't connect with throat singing till I was in university and my mother sent me some tapes and I was missing home so much and I needed the land. So I started singing just for years, like in the shower and down the street. And I was a painter by trade, so I never intended on having like a music career per se. And I... And then it just happened? It just just happened. Uh, I was at a festival for some paintings in Inuvik, and I did some throat singing around a midnight uh, midnight sun fire one night, and then the next day I was asked by the festival director to go on stage, and then I went on stage and did an improvised set with whoever was there, and there were friends of Bjork yeah. in the audience who audio, or who videotaped me, and then like two weeks later I got a call from her to go on world tour. <laughs> So it just like these things. So you don't have you don't have things to like. It's not like I have a record to tour. It's just two weeks later. Would you come on the road with Bjork? Yeah. Were you afraid of that? It was terrifying, but I mean, who the hell are you if you can't do terrifying things? Bingo! That's it right there. Like, who the hell are you if you don't face what scares you? You can't respect yourself if you do that. But that's how most people operate, though. Well, they're losers. <laughs> Just kidding. I know. They're not losers. They're works in progress, right? Works in progress. I, yeah, I, I wish we were doing this on another day. I'm no. so grumpy. No, this is the day. Uh, this is the day. Um, I'm way nicer than this on different days. The Bjork experience, um, she's amazing. She's incredible. And so that must have been a really just a fucking cool experience. Yeah, and she's really awesome. Yeah. She's a really awesome person. 
How do you warm your voice up? How do you prep? Don't. You don't. Do you need to? No. Will you need to? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) You just like walk on stage and and give breath. I I, I saw, I was in uh, Pagner Tongue and I saw throat singing and I thought, oh, that's that's cool, right? But I hadn't heard it with what you do to it and the music Mm -hmm. behind it, this, Mm -hmm. this whole other thing. How did that happen? Well, uh, like like I said, I uh, got these tapes in the mail, and I, when I was, I, I'd listen to it, and I could hear it. I could taste it. I could taste the land. I could hear it, and I missed it so much. And I had no one to teach me, so I just listen. I'd just like be playing these tapes and throat singing around my house, and because I had no one to teach me, and no one to basically no one to confine me to right. the specific sounds of the right. song it became uh, more more and a more expressive thing for me and okay. like in the same way that I expressed myself when I was dancing around in my mom's jewels it's began it began to carry my life experiences and my thoughts and my ideas and this is what has been really beautiful about the book because I the the common denominator between people like you know are, are that are alive is our breath mm-hmm. <clears throat> and our thoughts and then if you boil down our basic human needs and what we all think and feel without excluding everyone that's uh you know the breathing breath movement emotion and so, like the sound like it, it, well unfortunately there are people that are hearing impaired mm-hmm. and Geez, my heart goes out to them because I love sound so much. Um, <clears throat> but having sound be- become a, a a world, become a specific world where none of the other senses are having it, let it do- letting it dominate. So I had no one to teach me how to throat sing. So it just. But even hearing the new record, like hearing not just the singing, but the sounds. How did that hit you that this is what should be the music? Because the tapes that you heard, were, I'm sure, weren't that synthy, were they? No, 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 right. it was traditional throat yeah. singing. Yeah, so to, to put the combination of the two, was it? Did, did were you just laying in bed at one night or just throat singing, thinking, oh, if we had a, a Sigur Ross feel or a... Like how did that come together? Well, that's what that's another thing that's interesting, and I get posed this question a lot. And I got, and I, I'm not and definitely. I would tell you if I was annoyed by you. I'm not yeah. annoyed by that question, but I do get annoyed by some people that specify. Okay, so throat singing is your culture, but you decided to add metal and the yeah. electronics and that aren't part of your culture. And it's like, well, look, I grew up listening to ACDC like everyone else. Like just because we're up there doesn't mean we didn't have access. Access to oh, so Pink the, Floyd and what is like the intention of that question. <laughs> I'm well, more curious just, about the creative process because yeah. I think there's somebody listening who might be 14 who has a sound in their head and doesn't know the process by which they can go and add themselves to it. So well, I'm wondering how you got there. I think I'm just really thankful that uh, my father was so into his record player and really loved like you know Led Zeppelin and Hendrix and like yeah. The Doors or whatever he was listening to, and it was. Uh, Music was a big part, and then and then as a young person, like I said, uh, ACDC and Motorhead and that whole thing, and it fits so well in our kind of shit kicker yeah. kid, <laughs> lots of energy, yeah. you, you know, like uh, uh, th- so these parts happen naturally naturally when I'm addressing sound, these other things were also building blocks. And like, I was raving yeah. in university. So that, that, that would like, be so, a so I, yeah, like, and I, I connected when I was younger, like, um, I used to run marathons and stuff and I was very, very athletic. So connecting with dance was huge for me too. Right. So the music has always gone into me. It's always become I feel like it becomes part of my blood or it becomes part of like how the patterns of the liquid in my body moves or something. Like I've always just been hyper connected to sound, like I said, even when I was a young girl. So, of course, you hear something this percussive. What are you going to do? It's going to naturally align with uh, the, your own sound aesthetic. Just like you, when you're making a meal, what 
tastes good to you, you put the things that you think taste good and then you eat it and it satisfies you and that's kind of like what has happened with the music and I also love releasing control with who I work with like uh, Jesse Zubat and Jean Martin are two of the most interesting innovative forward thinking natural talented musicians I've ever met in my life Uh, like these guys you can just throw anything at them and they'll have the confidence to be able to respond and they'll have the confidence to lead and the confidence to follow and not no one's going ahead and no one's lagging behind and we just got this language going that became our reality like if I don't do it it's like that's that's my therapy music's I'm alive I think I'm alive today just because of the concerts and the interesting dichotomy between this like expression and what's happened with the book I feel like the book has been incredibly validating because like because of what people categorized me at on stage as like primitive or savage or punk or screaming or this or that or whatever they could reduce me to for being a fucking weirdo on the stage. But they can't like, print fucking weirdos. They had to come up with something yeah, else. Like, like whatever they think I'm doing that's right. like strange. Yeah. Um, it's the, the having the exact same feeling of what is happening to me on stage happen in word is really interesting I because imagine. I feel like there's a lot of people that has have validated me as an a quote unquote intellectual after writing the book and I find that really interesting because it it's kind of a test to how people are closed because just because I'm on stage doing this particular thing that feels natural and right to me doesn't reduce me to only that I think yeah. it's a big part of the Canadian arts culture. I had to do a presentation at the Governor General's Awards once, and I got a lot of grief because I had said that growing up, the group of seven were the seven drug dealers on the corner. Like, I don't know. I know who they are now, of course, but I didn't know who they were. And there's this elitism in the Canadian arts world that I've always rejected and it was like fuck you I like Slayer (laughs) well same when I was going to art school I remember having this disdain for the group of seven and saying to my instructor why we're studying manifest destiny we're studying these people that have like discovered this beautiful landscape I'm like where's the art that originally was based here right. like can 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 I see some of that or is this entire course based on the lens of colonialism and what right. what high art is and what uh contemporary art is and even just what art is it's so interesting to me that like who is given license and I made a tweet about this the other day like when I just wish like if you're gonna write about if you're gonna if you're gonna write about indigenous rights I understand that people want a full spectrum and I understand you need the clicks and I understand there's a majority base government and that there's a majority uh, cultural landslide of whiteness in Canada. But don't you want to hear both sides of what's happening? Why would you not hire an Indigenous writer? We're so hyper-educated. Like, I've had people, I've tried to tell people, like, um, I walk around and... um, on a daily basis, like anyone who knows me can tell you this, that like I really don't give a shit about accolades. But when it so happens that someone's looking down on me and judging me and reducing me to nothing, mm-hmm. that's when I'm just like, you know what? You owe me the same fucking respect that you'd give to an old white professor because I've got this shit under my belt. Right. Just like him. He, so, didn't want, he didn't want to play us, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know. Or yeah. you know, and and uh, it's it's really interesting seeing seeing how how that's all played out and how how the book has reflected on the music mm-hmm. and how um, what the, the the thing that's made me the happiest, the most happy about the book, is getting messages from Inuit saying, I remember doing that when I was a kid. That's great. Because when I was growing up, 
I didn't have an anchor. You're going through something that's confusing and people are complacent around you and hurt and letting things happen. And you don't have an anchor, somebody, something you can read, something you can listen to, something that placed us and our feelings and what's important in society. Mm -hmm. And that's why the arts are simply crucial. And that's why I'm super happy to, to see um, Indigenous people rising up in the arts. It's absolutely crucial. And especially if like Canada loves to go on about being multicultural and it's like, well, maybe you should be using, not using, you should be respecting the art that comes from the only people that aren't immigrants here. Right. It was here first. Yeah. yeah. Like really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, well, Barry Strait theory. And it's like, yeah, how many? They, there's like communities that are discovered that are or scientifically discovered at 30,000 years old in BC. Now, like, how fucking long ago did we have to yeah. come? You've been here for what, 200 years? That's right. 30,000 like, covers it. Yeah. Like, I've been here for 0. 0.6 seconds and now it's mine. <laughs> like, <right>. like, <laughs> Let's, uh, let's, let, me do, let me do two things here before. Is Motorhead's Ace of Spades the greatest rock song ever written? I love that song. It's, I'm trying to think. I don't know if there's a better one. Well, I like Eat the Rich a lot. Yeah, that's good. So what is Motorhead? <laughs> <laughs> As you would. What era were you raving? What years? Uh, I'm, I went to uni from... Well, when did I go? 94 to 98. Okay, so we're talking the faux fur... Pure oh, plur the era. I did the whole fucking thing. So like, it, it's so did, you, did you wear faux fur? See, I think uh, it's because you ripping on vegans makes me laugh. But I'm like, I, you rave. I bet you fucking no, wore faux fur. No, I wore terry cloth. You didn't wear faux fur. I did. I wore terry cloth. <laughs> it was like you. towels, everything. You never no, wore I never. I never wore fur, faux fur. Never. Uh, if you find a picture of it, I will. <laughs> I'll slap you like that bitch that slapped you in the bar. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, okay. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Oh, you're, yeah. And please, uh, yeah. This and is, edit me, please. No, no. This was great. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to play your songs, of course, and we'll play Motorhead and other stuff. What other songs should we play? Oh. Um, oh, that's so big. Yeah, what do you like? Like, what do you, what I, do you like? It, 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 Have you ever been, ever been somewhere and complained that the radio was playing shit? Well, yeah, but the, also I'm the type of person that it takes me a long time to order at a restaurant. I'm really indecisive, and I like a lot of things. So. Best uh, rave DJ or that era. What did you like to dance to? Wait, do you remember that era? I remember some of it. <laughs> I remember some of it. I've been on a real Richie Houghton kick. I've been on a real Plastic Man kick. So okay. I, I'll play, you know, but play that. Then. Okay. You are, yeah, like yeah, play that. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll give you a list afterwards, right, and then we'll add it in. Yeah, cool. Okay. There's so many, uh, there's some really sweet things in here too. And the stories, the longer stories, I, I kind of like the best, but. Yeah. No, we, we can do it. Um, but, um, less than a minute. Okay, ready? Yeah, what are you going to be reading? What, what you, am I reading? What are you going to read, yeah? Oh, just one of the, one of the poems. Okay. This tapestry has not been woven by accident. Silken deception, falsehoods twisted into each fiber, the blue water lost to a sea of red, red tide, poisonous intent disguised by the shine of the thread. When we weave, we weave past longing, Past glory, past greed, we weave the hunger, weave the need to conquer, to vanquish, to quell, with quill, with seed. We plant ideas, with bullets we heed, we raise fists, we draw fine lines to hold each other up against the ships. Sails, canvas, story, silk, survival is the only guide. We weave our own sinew, make a net to catch those not yet dead, those drowning on dry land. We will harvest the truth. We will collect the rent. This tapestry is being rewoven. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>